All right, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Christy Reardon, Director of the Office of Research at the American Neurological Association. On behalf of the AUA, I'd like to welcome you to this briefing on bladder, kidney, and prostate cancer research programs with the Department of Defense Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, or CDMRP. I would like to give a special welcome and thank you to our partner advocacy organizations, Zero, the End of Prostate Cancer, Kidney Can, and the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. You'll be hearing more about the work of these organizations throughout the briefing. I would also like to welcome our speakers, Dr. Bingham, Dr. King, and Dr. Dr. Kim, and Dr. Lee, who will discuss the importance of urological research, the unique aspects of CDMRP's research programs, and the impact of this research on scientific advancement and on patients. We're also delighted to have Dr. Scott Swanson, president of the AUA from 2020 to 2021, to speak about why this research matters to the AUA. At the conclusion of this presentation, we will have a question and answer session with our panelists. If you have questions prior to the end of the presentation, please feel free to type them into the Q&A feature so they can be answered at the end of the briefing. As your moderator for today, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Christy Reardon, and I started as the director of the American Urological Association Office of Research in February 2022, so I'm brand new. Prior to joining the AUA, I was a senior director of research and evaluation at Ripple Effect Communications a government contractor and woman-owned small business. In this role, I oversaw multiple simultaneous research and evaluation projects of large-scale biomedical research and health programs for the National Institutes of Health, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and for CDMRP. It is my pleasure to be here with you today to introduce some of our outstanding speakers and provide background on the CDMRP program. Here's our agenda for today. We will begin with Dr. Swanson, who will speak about the needs for urological research and the AUA's commitment to this research agenda. I will then provide an introduction to the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, highlighting programs on bladder, kidney, and prostate cancer. Dr. Bingham will speak to you as a consumer reviewer on the role of patients in CDMRP programs, followed by Dr. Kim, who will provide the perspective of a CDMRP scientific reviewer. Finally, Dr. Lee will discuss some of the many impacts of the CDMRP program. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Scott Swanson was the AUA president from 2020 to 2021. He's an accomplished physician and surgeon scientist, an associate professor of urology in the Mayo Clinic, College of Medicine and Science, and has received numerous honors and awards. Dr. Swanson served in the US Air Force from 1971 to 1987. He's here today to represent over 22,000 AUA members, urology surgeons and other physicians and clinicians, researchers, and others interested in advancing care for patients. Dr. Swanson, welcome, and we look forward to your remarks. Great to be here. Uh, welcome to the team, Dr. Riordan. It's really nice to see you. I, I had a great time speaking to uh, the group last year, and I hope that that we can continue that relationship. You know, I, I think part of our duties, when you folks have invested in research programs that are good for urology patients, is to steward those uh, efforts and to steward those investments. So we're going to give you a glimpse of why it's important, but also to give you a feel for how we've used the funds in the past. Um, one of our pillar missions, education and advocacy is the other, but is urologic research. And uh, without funding, you know, there wouldn't be any research. And without uh, advocacy, there wouldn't be any funding. And unless we educate people, there's not going to be any advocacy. So our purpose here today is to thank you for what you've done in the past and encourage that good work going forward in the future. You know, really, you mentioned 22,000 physicians, but we're really here to talk about the benefit of our patients and their families. And I think that's just as important as anything else. More and more, we're welcoming the patient advocacy groups uh, to, the, to the discussion because they add such a different and vibrant uh, purpose to all of our investigations. And so the patient and the advocacy groups are really, really important. I'll go to the next slide, please. Now, why does research matter to the AUA? And I'm going to uh, break a little bit here from the prepared remarks, but yesterday I operate on patients with prostate cancer, bladder cancer, kidney stones, and the sequelae of uh, their progress through other kinds of cancers. Uh, I had clinic this morning, and I'll have it again this afternoon, and I'm seeing patients there for hematuria, for urinary incontinence, for bladder cancer, for erectile dysfunction, for recurrent urinary tract infections, 
uh, transplant clearance patient uh, candidates and the whole myriad. The nice thing about urology is we're not kind of a one hit specialty. The patients we're dealing with oftentimes regard us as our primary uh, focus for their entire lives for diseases that fortunately uh, can last a long time. There's some statistics here about the prevalence of uh, some of the diseases like 79,000 new uh, kidney cancer patients. Uh, a few more than that, bladder cancer, 81,000. And the big, um, the highest number are the prostate cancer patients, uh, over 260,000. We see those deaths noted there, so it's a burden for the patients. But I'm struck as I talk to our, our patients, uh, both in the clinic and the operating room, how much the disease of one person affects the family members around them, how much it draws on their businesses and their uh, colleagues and their friends. So uh, even though we talk about deaths, which are important from these different diseases, I think we shouldn't lose track of the huge number of people that are affected by the diseases that we're dealing with, not just the patients themselves. And then if you look at uh, office visits for urology, you know, over 18 million office visits for non-cancer patients alone, and for the pediatric, uh, for our pediatric colleagues, almost 2 million. So why does research matter to the AUA? Well, it matters to the physicians, it matters to the patients, it matters to the families, it matters to the people, it matters to people around them. And that's why we're so um, enthusiastic about research and regard it as one of our pillars. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> you know, we really appreciate your uh, support of our, pro our programs, but we want to make sure that you understand that the AUA is kind of putting its money where its mouth is. Uh, we funded over 850 early career scientists over the course of the last 40 years and invested $34 million, not only in primary research, but in the development of these young men and women who are advancing their careers beyond clinical uh, care, but also into basic research. And you don't have to be in a um, academic medical center to be using research, to be contributing to the literature, or and at the very least, learning from it. Uh, we support um, individuals all the way from medical students and in some ways college students up to senior investigators. It's that important and the AUA, like I said, really puts its money where its mouth, with, mouth is. Next slide, please. Um, how do we support research? Well, it's education, that's the other pillar and our pillars are intertwined, but we've got to do the job of educating our uh, members and their staffs on how to interpret research, what research is coming down the pike, what cutting edge things are, are going on. And, it, and our research is not necessarily a one disease thing. Some of the technology and the surgical instrumentation and the applications apply to several different uh, patient populations. We also are, uh, as I alluded to, very interested in furthering the research careers of, uh, of our membership, whether they be in private practice or academic medicine. And, and it all again comes back to better patient care, better outcomes, uh, more efficient use of resources, et cetera. Next slide, please. How do we support research? Well, advocacy is the other thing. And we will talk to literally everybody who has a, an interest in uh, urologic research. On the government side, we're actively uh, discussing things with the NIH, Department of Defense, uh, veteran Affairs, and many, many others to, to uh, capture uh, their interests, to capture their imagination, to further the research processes, and again, to the care of the patients. Next slide. We're going to spend a little time, and in the, in the real nuts and bolts of our talk are these talented young men here who give examples of exactly why uh, investment by the CDMRP uh, comes through to these young careers, but also to the uh, patients that they treat. And you're going to hear about better radiologic imaging and genomics. You're going to hear about understanding targets for prostate cancer. Uh, so the response to treatments better overcoming the barriers to immunologic kidney cancer, uh, just to mention a few. And in closing, let me uh, really again, thank you. Next slide, please. Let me thank uh, the CDMRP for the search they've done up to date. The AUA really regards you as an ideal, as this is an ideal partnership, again, to help patients who are uh, like the people right next to us um, and the people that we know so well. Uh, your contributions, your investments helps not only the researchers, but the 
the work that's done. And it's really, really important for the AUA because it's important for our patients. So that's the last thing you, need. you don't need to hear any more from me. And I'm gonna turn it over to our young scientists who are, who are really the crux of this effort. Thank you, Dr. Swanson. As Dr. Swanson said, we're so grateful for the support of the members of Congress for biomedical research to help men, women, and children fighting cancer. One of the most critical targets of the support is the congressionally directed medical research programs. So I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce uh, or review some of the most important features of CDMRP. CDMRP originated in 1992 via congressional appropriation to foster novel approaches to breast cancer research in response to the needs of stakeholders, the American public, the military, and Congress. CDMRP has grown over the years and now funds a full spectrum of biomedical research needs, including discoveries from basic science, all the way through to clinical trials that bring new treatments to patients. There's a general misconception that CDMRP uh, programs are or could be duplicative of other federally funded medical research. However, this is far from true, as its programs fill unique and essential research needs. Here's a figure depicting the growth of CDMRP appropriations since its beginning in the early 1990s. The program began with a $25 million appropriation for breast cancer research and now has grown to almost 1.5 billion across 36 programs. Currently, this makes CDMRP the second largest funder of prostate cancer and kidney cancer behind the NIH, making it an extremely important in moving our scientific knowledge and discovery about these diseases forward. As you can see, prostate cancer funding was added in fiscal year 1997. Kidney cancer was added in fiscal year 2010 as part of the peer-reviewed cancer research program, or PRCRP. And kidney cancer funding was added as a dedicated program in fiscal year 2017. Finally, bladder cancer was added to the PRCRP in fiscal year 2016 and remains in that program. The vision of CDMRP is to transform healthcare for service members and the American public through innovative and impactful research. This vision makes CDMRP, uh, this makes the CDMRP vision and funding strategy unique. These programs find high impact, innovative, groundbreaking medical research to find cures, reduce the incidence of disease and injury, improve survival, and enhance the quality of life for those affected by disease. Supported research covers the full spectrum including basic, translational, and clinical research, including clinical trials, research training, and research infrastructure. CDMRP fills research gaps by funding high-impact, high-risk projects that are unlikely to be funded by other agencies. While individual programs are unique in their focus, all of the programs managed by CDMRP share the common goal of advancing paradigm-shifting research and solutions or technologies that will lead to cures or improvements in patient care. Notably, CDMRP involves consumer advocates throughout the program cycle and also supports the next generation of researchers as well as established scientists to foster collaboration and synergy that improves the research. CDMRP funding is meant to be complementary and never duplicative of other sources of biomedical research funding. Another key feature of CDMRP is that every program has its own annual visit setting where the program develops a new investment strategy for that year. This allows each program to determine how it will best advance research in the field based on the most recent discoveries and rapidly changing research needs and priorities. Unlike NIH, CDMRP must fund research projects for health conditions determined by Congress. During the vision setting and programmatic review process, the programmatic panel assesses the state of the science, including a review of what the program and other agencies, both public and private, are currently funding and the potential for duplicative research by CDMRP. As I mentioned before, it funds high in projects that other agencies may not venture to fund. While individual programs are unique, all of the programs managed by CDMRP share a common goal of finding cures and improving patient care. For the prostate cancer and kidney cancer programs, this vision setting is determined by physicians, scientists, and consumers, patients, and survivors who are dedicated to address the issues in each disease area. For instance, the Prostate Cancer Research Program has a strategic plan that outlines the program's approach for addressing critical gaps in prostate cancer research and patient care. Now we will turn our attention to bladder cancer. 
Bladder cancer is the sixth most commonly diagnosed cancer in the United States and the fourth most commonly diagnosed cancer among veterans. Veterans exposed to environmental and occupational risk factors, including herbicides such as Agents Blue and Orange, and the contaminated water supply at Camp Lejeune, are diagnosed with bladder cancer at higher rates. Burn pits are also being monitored as a potential risk factor. The research undertaken within the CDMRP for veteran populations is critical, has wide-ranging applications for all bladder cancer patients. Bladder cancer research is currently situated within the peer-reviewed cancer research program and does not have its own line item like prostate cancer and kidney cancer. The peer-reviewed cancer research program is an umbrella program encompassing a number of cancer research programs that do not have their own line items. Though bladder cancer is housed in the PRCRP, advocates are working to secure a permanent line item and establish a specific bladder cancer research program to better address research needs in this area. This slide shows a summary that's taken directly from the CDMRP website that shows their approach to transforming healthcare through innovative and impactful research works. Within prostate cancer alone, CDMRP is responsible for the development in the detection and diagnosis, including rapid testing, as well as the development or testing of new therapeutics that have already transformed prostate cancer treatment. Kidney cancer research is about 20 years behind prostate cancer research, but CDMRP is aiding new investigators to create new collaborations and rapidly advance the field. As I mentioned on the previous slide, bladder cancer does not have its own line item, but you will hear about the importance of CDMRP bladder cancer research later in this presentation. I'll close out my portion of the presentation with a few final comments on how CDMRP funds the best research for patients and has a unique impact on cancer research. Unlike other funding organizations, CDMRP does not fund applications based solely on scientific merit. While this is very important, CDMRP also focuses on filling research gaps by funding high impact, innovative, and groundbreaking medical research that is unlikely to be funded by other agencies. CDMRP involves and considers the needs of each disease community, incorporating consumers or patients as voting members in vision setting, investment strategy, and both tiers of review. While individual programs are unique, all the programs managed by CDMRP focus on solutions that will lead to cures or improvements in patient care or breakthrough technologies and resources for clinical benefit. With that, I'd like to introduce Ali Manson, Vice President of Government Relations and Advocacy for Zero the end of prostate cancer. Thanks, Dr. Riordan. I'm Allie Manson. As she said, the Vice President of Government Relations and Advocacy at Zero, the end of prostate cancer. For those who aren't familiar with us, Zero is the leading national nonprofit with the mission to end prostate cancer. At Zero, we work in advocacy, including the work done at the PCRP and access to care issues. But I really want to talk for a moment about the resources we provide for prostate cancer patients and their families from early detection to survivalship. Next slide. Supported by our national and chapter staff, we ensure that patients have all the support they need, whether it's through Zero 360, which offers comprehensive 360 degree patient navigation, including financial support, insurance navigation, second opinions, the whole shebang. Um, Zero Drive, which gives patients no matter their income level, all they have to do is be eligible. All they have to do is be receiving prostate cancer treatment, and they receive financial resources to help them get to and from their care. Zero Caregiver Connector and Zero Mentor, which are mentorship programs for both those with prostate cancer and their family members, connecting them with others in like situations who can provide support and insight as they go through their journeys. And finally, we have the US2 Prostate Cancer Support Groups. They're a national, in fact, international network of support groups for those with prostate cancer and their caregivers and loved ones to get the kind of community support you need in order to go through your prostate cancer journey. I hope you'll use our resources and share them with others. In the meantime, it is my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Patrick Bingham. Dr. Bingham is an educator, a U.S. Army veteran, a prostate cancer survivor, advocate, and zero champion. After a career in the Army, Dr. Bingham spent 30 years as a teacher, a principal, and a school district administrator. In recent years, he's turned his prostate cancer experience into a motivator as he serves others. Dr. Bingham is a zero champion, a leader in our patient community, 
a member of the Zero Veterans Prostate Cancer Working Group, an advocate for both state, state and federal policy for prostate cancer, and importantly for today's purposes, a consumer reviewer for the Prostate Cancer Research Program. It is my honor and my pleasure to welcome Dr. Patrick Bingham. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am just sort of flattered by that complimentary introduction uh, from Allie there. I want to thank uh, Allie for basically uh, helping me along this journey of becoming, I guess, an advocate on behalf of so many uh, prostate cancer patients. And I also want to thank Adina for allowing me to take part in this event. Uh, I'd like to start off and kind of go into two parts um, uh, from my perspective. One is my story to kind of let you know how I got to where I am from my cancer diagnosis to becoming an advocate. Um, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2005. And up until that point, I must say, although I consider myself a learned person, I really had no idea what a prostate was, what it was for, why the doctor did certain uh, studies on you or, or things when you went in for the uh, your annual checkups. And so in 2005, I was considered on the early end uh, when I first went in and, and thanks to my wife, she's the one that as we started talking and uh, things that were going on uh, with my bodily function, we started thinking, well, is there something going on? And uh, doing one of my annual checks up, uh, my doctor said something's going on here. We might need to do some further testing. Um, came back and he said, well, if you have some elevated PSA counts. And so as a, as the good son I was, well, if I, I call my father up and he tells me, well, now it's probably nothing. Uh, your uncle Fred and I both have enlarged prostates. And so this is a case where oftentimes they say father knows best, but this was a case where no father didn't know best. And so I probably waited a little longer, but uh, when I went back for a follow on, they uh, explained to me that your, your PSA, your prostate specific agent is very, is elevated well past four now, and it shouldn't be. So we perhaps want to do a, um, you know, biopsy, you know, go in and do some things. And so um, I was still kind of ignorant what was going on. So I went in and I had a very, uh, I would say a very good urologist. Um, he was a, a former uh, Navy captain. And uh, as he went through and he started explaining to me and told me what was going to happen when the biopsy came back, well, nine out of the 10 um, specimens, biopsy portions were cancerous. And at the time, you know, I really didn't know uh, what to do. And he started explaining, hey, to read these items. I give you some documents to read. And then for me, he said, well, if there are really two options, you can have a brachiotherapy, which is um, radiation inserted seeds inside your um, scrotum area, or you can have your prostate removed. And so at the time I'm thinking, okay, that sounds like a, a good plan. Um, I went through that procedure, didn't think much about it. Uh, but as time went by, um, you know, my wife started uh, sharing with people, you know, my husband had prostate cancer and this is what it was. And so I found more and more individuals uh, started coming and asking me questions, which led me to say, let me get smarter. And before I knew it, I had gotten connected with zero prostate. And unbeknownst to me, there was all the additional research that had been done. There was basically an advocacy group out there for men like me, uh, because what I did know at the time until I was kind of engaged in getting information with that one, I was an African-American male. And after getting literature, I found out, well, wow, you are more, you were in a, in a population group that's two times more likely to die from prostate cancer, as well as a one in seven chance of getting prostate cancer, which I had never thought about, didn't know that. And then also I found out though, through the research provided through Zero that well, military members are also, veterans are also more prone to get uh, prostate cancer. Uh, studies have shown that because of uh, use of Agent Orange and other herbicides during the Vietnam era, that that was a possibility that there was an increased portion there. And here recently, uh, the studies have shown that uh, there might be some situations from burn pits and everything. So it was very easy for me when I was asked by Allie and Tracy Kreitz, who's our Texas, Oklahoma, um, sponsor out here for us to basically start doing more because I felt like if I can help educate other men, if I can talk to, you know, people at Congress or representative, just other men to let them know what's going on. So when the opportunity came last fall for me uh, to be selected as a consumer reviewer, well, I thought, well, sounds like a good idea. 
um, and felt very honored and humbled that I'd be allowed to do so. And so my experiences, I would tell people when I had a chance to talk, is that I would do it again at a heartbeat. You know, it was a little intimidating at first because they said, well, uh, there's some training force to go through. There's a, there's a two types of documents that will be there. There's the technical review portion and there's the consumer review portion. So I'm thinking, I'll try to read that technical portion first. Well, big mistake. Um, it was very complex, almost intimidating. But as I had a chance to basically go through and look at the consumer review part and then really understand because the situation that they place you in was for you to be successful in talking to the members of that panel. And I am I'm still in awe and so impressed and uh, just uh, thrilled to have worked with, I would call, the brilliant people in our country from, from doctors, medical doctors, to researchers, to just the other peer reviewers that were involved. And also knowing that there was people that were basically willing to take that step that you don't know about without having a chance to sit and listen to them talk and then value their portion as well. So going through, uh, for me, I guess it was so important because one, you're reading items that have, I would call it, uh, life-saving and, and life-altering implications for, for those that are basically putting proposals forward to the end product, those that will benefit. And I like to share with people, for me, it was almost like being a, a kid in a candy store, where as we had a chance to read up for 20 proposals, you'd think like, wow, I wish they'd had that one when I was going through it. This is going to be great for, you know, people that are uh, going through cancer, you know, prostate cancer, either diagnosis or basically treatments now to know that there were basically there's government funds because of Congress and Department of Defense. There are funds there that are allowing these proposals to take place. And that's the part I can't emphasize enough is that without those funds, um, there would not have been be situations where we can look and see new developments, new drugs, things that will basically uh, reduce that lethality, as they say, of prostate cancer for not only just African-American men, but military veterans as well. But also, because we're just a microcosm of society, there are other men out there that will basically benefit as well. Uh, and so for me, as I went through, and just thanks to information that I learned from zero, thanks to information through uh, CDMRP, you know, basically I realized that, wow, this is a much bigger uh, area than I even realized. And uh, knowing that, well, prostate cancer is the most highly diagnosed cancer among males. And that is also um, the second most lethal cancer for men. And I think I'd heard earlier during one of the other um, presentations of how it affects so many people. Well, a good friend of mine who is also a prostate cancer survivor here in Texas, well, during a recent uh, session we had talking to congressional uh, legislative assistance, um, when you talk about prostate cancer like so many others, it affects not just the prostate cancer person, but the significant other as well, be it their wife, be it their significant other, be it their partner. And so it affects family as far as what they're, what they're going through. Um, the same day as we were do, talking to congressional representatives, my wife got a call from a friend of ours, a former a retired army colonel who had just been diagnosed with prostate cancer and wanted to talk to me about my experience. So it lets you know just how pervasive the situation is. And so for me, it's, it was important as a consumer reviewer that they were able to look at that patient perspective because there were the scientific portions, but from a patient perspective, they valued what we had to say because they say we've been in those trenches, we've had those experiences, or we had friends that had those experiences as well. And it also gives those insights that the patient has as myself or, or survivors, those insights you have because you have experience. And so when they discuss, well, uh, different ways of, uh, of um, doing biopsies or less intrusive ways, which was a key for me because um, I think it's important that you want the patient to probably be as comfortable as possible when they're going through it because it can be tough depending on when a person diagnosed and the, the uh, extent of what their cancer is. And so one of the final things I'd like to basically make, uh, make clear is that 
because of CDMRP, uh, FDA has approved seven different treatments over the last 10 years, as well as basically they've been allowed to put together at least 200 clinical trials that probably wouldn't be possible, not to mention the different perspectives, the different information, different proposals that are able to be, you know, promoted and funded uh, because of that. And so for that, uh, it's a program that I am just, uh, anytime I get a chance to talk about either zero prostate or my uh, role as a CDMRP consumer viewer, I gladly jump at the opportunity. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce um, Mr. Brian Lewis from Kidney Can. Great, great. Thank you, Dr. Bingham. I appreciate the introduction. Um, and thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, I'm Brian Lewis, the president of Kidney Can, and I'm a co-founder of that organization. I'm also a husband and father and a kidney cancer survivor. I just wanted to take one quick moment to tell you about what we're doing in the kidney cancer space vis-a-vis -vis the CDMRP. Um, as you heard, uh, kidney cancer was identified as a, a line item recipient in the KCRP program in FY17, fiscal year 17, 2018. Kidney cancer historically has been underfunded and we're trying to play catch up. And uh, what we are seeing is a, an emergence of young and early career investigators pivoting towards kidney cancer and, and starting to, to look at kidney cancer as a career option and the research of kidney cancer. So we're, so Kidney Can, our organization decided we needed to go out and build a grassroots army to start advocating for continued funding for this. And we've been building that army and just the last two days we've been spending doing a virtual uh, Hill Day like uh, the AUA is gonna be doing next week, um, except we weren't in person. Uh, but we've been successful in, in raising awareness and that awareness has led to more advocacy. That advocacy has led to funding and the funding we hope someday will lead to more cures. Um, the next slide, please. I just wanted to highlight too that you know, as we've been bringing this grassroots army in FY17, since then, we've been raising the stakes every year. And fortunately, Congress has been listening and we now have $50 million annually appropriated. Uh, the omnibus that just came out or is in process of, at the Senate, I believe, um, has the 50 million in it. And uh, we're looking forward to FY23 where, when we're gonna make another increased ask to 60 million. And so I wanted to thank the AUA for this opportunity because you, know, you all are um, a big part of, of how kidney cancer is being elevated in, in awareness, and we, we appreciate this opportunity. Um, it's now my distinct pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Hyun Kim from Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. Um, Dr. Kim is the Homer and Gloria, Gloria Harvey Family Chair of Urolo Urologic Oncology. He's also the Director of the Academic Urology Program He's the Associate Director of the Urolo Urology Residency Training Program, and he's a Professor of Surgery. Um, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Kevin Kim. Well, thank you, Mr. Lewis, for that uh, introduction. Uh, Brian and I met in Washington, D.C., while actually advocating for research funding for uh, urologic cancers. We happen to run into each other and we've been uh, close friends ever since. So uh, I hope to see you next week uh, when we all end up in Washington, D.C. Um, I want to thank the uh, organizers for giving me the chance to speak about uh, something that's near and dear to my heart, research funding. Uh, this is something that's um, uh, vital to what I do and what many of my fellow scientists do. But before I start, let me just back up a little bit and tell you uh, my story about how I became interested in, in research. Uh, you might wonder, why does someone uh, devote their life to research? What drives them? What makes them uh, tick? Well, uh, when I was in college, um, uh, I was curious about uh, what a research career might be. So I sought out a, a researcher who would take me under his wings and kind of show me around. Um, I met a, a doctor named Professor Gans, and he was a, a grouchy old guy, but uh, one who clearly was interested in mentoring students. And under his mentorship, I studied snake locomotion. So uh, I had a um, 
a research project where we were trying to figure out how a snake which has no legs can move so fast through uh, dirt, through sand, through uh, rocks and tre uh, between trees. Some of them even swim in water and can fly it through the air. Um, but uh, uh, what uh, that experience did for me is it's um, helped me understand uh, that uh, you can be curious and then there is a method and a process for satisfying that curiosity and then making a discovery uh, that uh, adds to the knowledge that we have as humans. Now, um, ultimately, I became a doctor and a urologist. Uh, I split my time between patient care and research. I run a basic science laboratory, but uh, most of my day is spent taking care of patients. Uh, I operate on them. I sit with the patient and their family to counsel them, to help them make decisions. Uh, for example, I, uh, I see patients uh, who have very advanced cancer, kidney cancer, uh, bladder cancer, uh, I do my best. We offer them the latest state-of-the-art treatment. We operate on them. We, uh, we administer radiation. We give them chemotherapy. And sometimes that's not enough. The cancer wins. Uh, and then I have to face the patient and their family, deliver the bad news, watch them cry, watch them uh, help them seek out additional treatment, clinical trials sometimes. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, what we can do as physicians um, is can be limited. And so uh, what uh, motivates me now as a doctor uh, is not just curiosity, but it's the desire to do more for my patients. Uh, I will be very disappointed if in five years I am offering my patients the same treatments I am offering them now. It's got to be better. It's got to be more effective. Uh, when a patient is trying to decide between uh, a treatment that can that has a 30% cure rate but can leave them incontinent for life, that's a difficult decision. I feel for my patients. They have to. It's a very difficult choice, and I'm not sure how I would. Uh, um, decide myself in the same, if I were the patient, uh, but it's a terrible choice that they have to make. And I wish I had a, a, a biomarker, uh, a magic test that would help um, them uh, uh, make a choice so that the cure rate that they have to pick is not 30%, but maybe 90%. Uh, and then the risk of side effects like the incontinence goes down so that um, uh, it's it really becomes minimal. And in, in that scenario, the decision becomes more straightforward. It's easier to make. And so um, my daily interactions with patients uh, certainly is now the driving force uh, behind why I do research. Now, when you think about the research funding that's available to people like me, uh, the primary sources of funding uh, include uh, the NIH, the DOD, and um, companies, public industry, for-profit uh, companies like pharmaceutical companies. The NIH, their research funding is organized around disease mechanism, so biological processes. And so the um, diseases that get the most attention are the ones that have the most interesting biologic processes. So the diseases I take care of, for example, kidney cancer, prostate cancer, and bladder cancer may or may not be the one that everyone wants to study. And when industry wants to fund research, uh, they're going to fund research where, the, uh, where there's the potential for greatest profit. So um, when you want to direct money uh, to a disease that a uh, patient suffers from, and you want to take um, pr uh, profit uh, potential out of the picture or um, the disease biology out of the picture and really focus on how do you help this particular patient with these types of diseases, uh, you really come to DOD funding because the DOD funding is earmarked uh, to go to a specific cancer type. And so when I'm trying to um, uh, uh, get funding for a kidney cancer project, a bladder cancer project, or a um, uh, prostate cancer project, the D DOD it becomes a very important place. 
Um, I've served as both a, uh, a peer reviewer and I've also chaired a peer review session for the DOD. So the way the process works uh, is that um, uh, we uh, may review in one section, maybe 20, 30 uh, applications. And unfortunately, only uh, about 10 to 15% of those applications are gonna get funding. The rest will not. Uh, I've prepared grants. Uh, I prepare grants all the time for um, as an applicant uh, for, uh, for these funding mechanisms. And I will tell you, that uh, two months before a grant is due, every evening and weekend is devoted to writing and discussing and perfecting that grant. It takes a tremendous amount of work. And so uh, when you submit this grant and it gets funding, of course, that's great, but often, to, more often than not, it does not get funded. And it's a, a soul crushing experience. And, um, uh, of the people who've graduated with me from training and have gone into research, uh, I would say uh, many people eventually drop out because of lack of funding. Uh, and these are brilliant people who are incredibly well-trained, who simply don't have the support uh, to continue on as researchers. And this is important because uh, these are important resources we need to, uh, that can, that, uh, and, and work that needs to be done so that we can live healthier lives. Uh, the problem with uh, the research in, uh, funding environment right now is we have, um, we in a review session, out of 20 applications, 15 are really good. 10 are so good that I, I feel that the project really needs to be done. Uh, and yet only two or three are funded. So any additional money that can be directed into the DOD is gonna, uh, is gonna go to funding uh, great research because uh, they're out there, I've seen them. And not only is it gonna fund great research, but it's gonna keep scientists who have great ideas, who are working incredibly hard in the field. Uh, because if you can't get funding, then you become a doctor who takes care of patients and only, and that's important too. But uh, a researcher has uh, the potential not only to impact the lives of their patients, but lives of patients all throughout the country. And so my message to you is please help us get more funding. Uh, there are researchers um, and ideas and projects out there that are worthy of that additional funding. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stephanie Chisholm and I'm the Director of Education and Advocacy at the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. I'd like to thank Dr. Reardon and the American Neurological Association for everything that they do on behalf of the more than 700,000 patients plus their families who've been diagnosed with bladder cancer in the United States. We are the oldest and largest bladder cancer specific patient advocacy organization. Our mission is to address awareness issues, education and support for patients to fund research and to advocate when necessary for our population. And we started in 2005 when Diane sapersky Qualley and her husband, John, who was diagnosed in 2000, were really um, struck by how little money was going into bladder cancer research. And I'm very excited to say that after 17 years, this year alone, we will donate and dedicate $850,000 to research alone. We knew that it was really important early on that researchers had a career path to become experts in bladder cancer. And we do support young investigators. I'm so pleased to introduce an early career investigator who is funded by a CDMRP award. After advanced urologic oncology training at MD Anderson Cancer Center, Dr. Roger Lee, who is a genital urinary oncologist um, who focuses on the treatment of bladder, prostate, and upper tract urothelial cancers at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Florida, had submitted a grant to CDMRP. His research interest includes genomic characterizations of genital urinary malignancies in an attempt to tailor specific therapies for patients 
So it's really exciting. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Lee because I know you would rather hear from him. And Dr. Lee, if you'd like to take it over. Thank you so much, Stephanie, uh, for your kind introduction. And um, I, I would specifically like to thank uh, both our friends at Beacon and also at the AUA for um, all of the efforts that you put in to support bladder cancer research, to provide the educational information for both of our bladder cancer patients and also bladder, or for our urologic trainees. And I'd like to uh, thank um, our, uh, the, the members of Congress who are tuning in and others uh, to learn a little bit about um, bladder cancer research. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my own research and also the uh, impact of CDMRP on bladder cancer care, as well as my trajectory as a surgeon scientist. But um, starting off, I just wanted to uh, use the slides to point out the lack of funding that traditionally has been happening in bladder cancer. So no matter how you slice and dice it, whether by incidence or per mortality, you can see there that bladder cancer is one of the most, the least uh, funded uh, cancer sites that there is. And perhaps as a direct result of this, you can see that um, in this study conducted between 2014 and 2018, bladder cancer really didn't advance too much in terms of reduction of cancer mortality. Next, please. And next. So bearing this in mind, we know that uh, bladder cancer is one of the most commonly diagnosed cancers in the United States. And um, certainly there are a lot of unmet needs, one of which is actually the use of neoadjuvant treatment for patients with aggressive muscle invasive bladder cancer. So uh, typically the patients uh, with muscle invasive bladder cancer uh, will have to undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by radical cystectomy. And most of these patients uh, will benefit from the neoadjuvant chemotherapy in order to reduce the metastatic burden that's present at the time of diagnosis. Despite this, about 50% of the patients actually will, uh, will have, um, micro, uh, will, will not be able to qualify for neoadjuvant chemotherapy because they have other comorbidities that will limit their ability to tolerate um, neoadjuvant chemo. Uh, if we could back up two slides, please. So under these circumstances, we investigated the effect of a oncolytic virus therapy in which the virus is actually injected into the bladder and it detects uh, specifically the cancer cells within the bladder, causes cancer cell kill, which then releases proteins that are specific to the cancer cells and then induces a cancer specific immune reaction that further reduces the burden of cancer. Next slide. And this is just an, a more in-depth view of what's happening after the oncolytic virus is injected, where uh, in the blue there, you see that cancer lysis causes the release of these proteins um, that are then detected by the different uh, immune cells in the panel B uh, that congregate right around the tumor cells, which in turn will provide the immune reaction against the cancer cells to further the cancer kill. Next slide. So we really asked the question whether or not we can use this new agent in combination with immune checkpoint blockade, which is another type of immunotherapy, to fill the gap of the patients who cannot get the neoadjuvant chemotherapy that we just spoke of and um, provide some benefit for these patients so that once we remove their bladders, they are truly free of disease. So with this, um, we started a clinical trial that is going to enroll 30 patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer being treated with the oncolytic virus and nivolumab or the immune checkpoint blockade prior to radical cystectomy, which is a surgical procedure to remove their bladders and to see after their bladders are removed whether or not the cancer is truly affected by the therapy. Next slide. So we specifically looked at characteristics in the tumor cells um, that would predict their response to this new form of treatment. 
And you can see in the top middle panel there, the E2F, which is a protein that's expressed by the tumor cells, is highly expressed in the patients who had response denoted by CR uh, versus those patients who did not respond to therapy. So that was very clear to us. The second question that we asked is whether or not using this novel therapy, we can actually induce the immune reaction that we theorize would be indu induced after the therapy has been started. And long story short, there are these proteins within the tumor cells that we can use um, next generation sequencing uh, to predict that the tumor cells actually express. And we can actually find out whether or not the patients have generated immune reactions to it on blood samples that are collected while they're undergoing therapy. And as you can see on the top right panel there, in blue, that's the amount of reaction that we see at, type, uh, at week two versus in orange there at week six of treatment, um, you see that there's a heightened reaction indicating that there is truly this anti-tumor specific immune reaction that we're seeing after treatment is completed. Next slide. So these are just some representative images of the tumor samples that we've collected following treatment. And um, to make it simple, the brighter it is, the more immune cells that we actually find within the tumor microenvironment. And we have seen that with some treatments, uh, in some patients after treatment, that there is this heightened immune response, while in others, this immune response is really not generated. So uh, with this study, we actually propose to find out why it is that in some patients, this immune uh, immunotherapy agent works really well, while in others, it doesn't. Next slide. And along with that, um, in conjunction with developing this new agent that we could potentially bring to the, um, the patients with uh, cisplatin ineligible disease, um, we can also, I, I also, plan to uh, use this opportunity in the three years of the funding to improve myself as a surgeon scientist. And there are three different goals that I intend to do during this period. First, um, as you can see, there are a lot of uh, clinical trial related items that are in this uh, proposal. So through uh, working through those different items, I'm going to increase my proficiency as a clinical trial um, a clinical trialist during that uh, time. Second, I can also learn how to use these data to interpret the genomic information that we derive from the cancer specimen um, to understand how the genomic data is interpreted and how that can be used to benefit the patient. And number three, I can also learn about the immunology that is uh, backing a lot of the immunotherapy advances that we see not only in bladder cancer, but in other cancers. So in these three years that are funded by the CDMRP, that provides me with an adequate time so that I can develop myself as a surgeon scientist. So I have the abilities to conduct uh, multidisciplinary studies to help advance the field. Next slide. So I really like to use um, this slide and to end with um, the fact that I think physician scientists are truly at the center of advancements, not only in bladder cancer, but in other cancers. Um, we directly see patients and we understand, uh, like Dr. Kim had mentioned before, uh, the impact that the cancer has on the patient's lives. And we also, see directly the success, the joy that's derived from the successes of our treatment and the sadness that's derived from the failure of our, our, our treatments. And um, as a physician, we really use these, both of these to drive ourselves in order to understand the disease better in order to also come up with new therapies to help patients. And in order to do this though, we have to not only understand the clinical side of things, but also understand the scientific side of things so we can integrate the two together to help our patients. And if it weren't for the CDMRP program, I don't think that I would uh, otherwise have the opportunity to kind of learn both sides of the coin 
in order to bring everything together to make uh, scientific advancement a, a, a reality. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'd like to turn it over back to Dr. Reardon. Thank you, Dr. Lee. To bring the, this briefing to a close, I'd like to emphasize that CDMRP funding for biomedical research is unique and critically important to address the research needs for military members, veterans, patients, and their families. Currently, there's a particular need for a permanent bladder cancer line item within CDMRP appropriations. I'd like to recommend review of the CDMRP website included on this slide. It includes not only an overview of CDMRP programs, but specific information about each program's emphasis and research they have supported. I wanna say thank you to all of our panelists for participating today and lending their expertise. I also wanna thank all of you for attending today's session on behalf of the AUA, Zero, Kidney Can, and the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network and all of our advocacy partners. We appreciate your attendance and attention in learning about CDMRP and its impact on prostate, kidney, and bladder cancer research communities and for our patient communities.